Our next speaker is uh, Richard Wan. Richard is the editor of TR Emeritus. Oh. He's also a businessman, one of the most hardworking people I know. And if you read tremeritus.com, you know, sometimes it doesn't portray him like what he actually is in real life. A very nice man. So, a round of applause for Richard Wan, please. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, good afternoon, uh, fellow netizens and bloggers. I would like to start by examining what MDA has said with regard to their light touch policy. Now, according to MDA, it said that. Now, according to MDA, it said that they have been very judicious in issuing takedown notices since the class license scheme came into effect in uh, 1996. It said that uh, since 1996, there has only been one takedown notice for religiously offensive content, that is the uh, innocence of Muslim video, and 23 other instances of mainly pornography related contents uh, due to public com comment, uh, complaints. Now, uh, what this means is this, on the average, then we are talking about less than 1.5 takedown notices per year for the last 17 years. So, therefore, we can conclude two things from this uh, little observation. Number one, uh, we can observe that the Singapore blogging community is generally very discerning and law-abiding. So, I think give yourself a clap. Now, so, that being the case, why the need for MDA to come up with more rules and regulations? Now, the second observation is this. The low takedown rate is also due to the fact that the infringing uh, online cases are already being handled by the other existing laws. Existing laws already address some of the online infringement because some of the past offenders were prosecuted under the other laws. And again, we ask ourselves, why the need for MDA to come up with more rules and regulations? Indeed, netizens and bloggers are questioning exactly this. Why the need for MDA to come up with more rules and regulations? Marua, a Singapore human rights group, wrote to the Straits Times uh, a few days ago, arguing that uh, existing laws such as the Sedition Act, the Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act, already restrict and control online discussion of sensitive issues relating to race and religion. So in the past, prosecution have also been successfully undertaken over online hate speech using such laws. And in addition, there are other laws like the penal code, which can also be used to deal with online infringements for offences affecting public tranquility, safety, decency and morals. And the penal code also deals with words or writings with deliberate intent to wound the religious or racial feelings of anyone or to intimidate or insult anyone. So as you can see, there's a whole bunch of uh, rules and regulations already there and they are interlocking, you know, supporting one another. So when there's an uh, online infringement, it's really up to the uh, Attorney General, AGC, to decide which law to use against you. Then there's the uh, Telecommunication Act to deal with uh, rumour mongering causing undue alarm to the public. If you remember, last year, uh, there was a 19-year-old youth who was arrested for posting an online hoax that a national serviceman was shot dead during a training exercise at Sambawa. Uh, the 19-year-old youth was arrested for transmitting a false or fabricated message under the Telecommunication Act. So, when asked why, we, why the need to impose an additional layer of MDA regulation, given that there are already so many existing laws dealing with online re infringement, uh, this is what our uh, Dr. Jacob said. He is, by the way, the Minister for Communication and Information. So he said, an individual license places a stronger onus on the individual licensee operating that website to be aware of its legal obligations and to report responsibly. He added, 
investment. Going by the reaction of some of these uh, internet content providers, it would appear that all of them are, not all of them are fully aware of the content standards in the class license. Otherwise, why would they argue that they will be censored? So, uh, Dr. Jacob seems to be saying that the new M MDA regulations are enacted so as to make the licensed websites more aware of their legal obligation. Now, I find this to be a very weak argument because everyone knows that ignorance of the law is no excuse. One can't simply just go to court you know, and tell the judge that, uh, oh, he doesn't, uh, because he or she doesn't know the law, so let, let he or she be excused. And so there's really no need to enact laws just to make people more aware of existing laws and their legal obligations. Now, for example, does it make sense uh, that, say, the government enacts a new law imposing every, citi every citizen, like you and me, to put up a performance bond of $1,000 each so as to make us aware of our legal obligations not to litter or to speak in public? This is ridiculous, right? Because there are already existing laws covering littering and uh, speaking. Dr. Jacob is also saying that new sites may need to be licensed and individual blocks are exempted. Now, uh, again, let, let, me, let me just go through the definition of the Singapore News, which uh, Andrew and Ravi previously have already mentioned, and I'm going to repeat it one more time. Also, uh, a Singapore News program is any program, a program is essentially a production. Uh, is any news program containing any news intelligence report of occurrence or any matter of public interest? Now take note of this last phrase, or any matter of public interest about any social, economic, political, cultural, artistic, sporting, scientific, or any other aspect of Singapore. Again, I repeat the last phrase. Or any other aspect of Singapore in any language, but does not include any program produced on or behalf of, by the government. So, uh, I think in Hokkien it's called Pao Sua Pao Hai. Everything is, everything and anything that's under the sun about Singapore is considered Singapore news by that definition. With the exception that the news comes from government, then it's not counted. Lah. So, you know, why use such a broad definition? And make no mistake, this is written in black and white. Now, Dr. Jacob may be very magnanimous to interpret that individual blog contents will not be classified as news content. But what if a new minister comes on board who is not as uh, magnanimous as uh, Dr. Jacob and decide that the individual contents can also be considered news by virtue of the written definition which I've just cited above. Uh, the other thing is with regard to the new regulation which is which a licensed website need to comply within 20 hours within 24 hours of take down notice from MDA if it, if the MDA finds that the content to be in breach of uh, content standard under the class license scheme now I just want to highlight this little hidden clause inside one of the class license uh, scheme documents and that clause said uh, and that's in fact it's called clause 4. A licensee who is in doubt as to whether any content would be considered prohibited may refer such content to the authority to the authority for its decision. So in other words, the authority has the final say whether a website considered website content is considered prohibited or not. So given all the above reasons, how can the authority blame the netizens and bloggers for questioning the intent of the authority for the sudden introduction of the new MDA regulations? Indeed, many netizens remain unconvinced of the need for the new regulations and during the talking point talk show uh, a few days ago, it was 73% polls say that the new regulation will limit online content. 
many on the ground are feeling that this sudden introduction of uh, new regulation is politically motivated to curtail criticism against the government. And uh, we all know that online criticisms against the government have been increasing, especially since the last general election in 2011. The government must understand that people criticize because they are unhappy with the many policies of the government. They have no other outlets to ban or to criticize except through the internet. This is especially so in the current climate, uh, media climate of Singapore. So we are currently like a kettle of boiling water with steam coming out from the spout. Now the last thing you want to do is to take a stopper and stick it onto the spout of the kettle so as to block the steam from coming out. Now if you don't want the kettle of boiling water generating that much steam, the correct way to do it is to lower the fire that is causing the water to boil. In other words, reverse those unpopular policy and you will get fewer grievances and less criticism online from the people. I therefore call upon the authorities to remove the new MDA regulation which are clearly not compatible with the first world standard. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. <coughs> Um, the government actually has uh, replied for all the criticisms and the questions that we have. And here is one of the, uh, Jacob Ibrahim himself. After we all criticize him, right, he say, ah yeah, you all make so much noise. Okay? I think the best way for is for people to see, after the licenses are issued, whether the activists are indeed limited in their public discourse. I expect that the sites will continue to operate as before. In fact, I hope that the activists who are today making this far-fetched claim will be honest enough to admit it when the time comes. This is what Yaku Ibrahim says. Briefly, what he is saying is, trust me. This one, in fact, the, report, the, the news reported this, right, that the MDA will enforce the regulations judiciously. This is what they say. Trust me, I'm not going to, you know, uh, regulate everyone. But here's the problem, you see. Freedom of speech in Singapore is a guarantee under the Constitution. As citizens of Singapore, we have the right to free speech. Yeah, yeah. Right? But what Yaakov Ibrahim is saying is, you know what, I come up with regulation, but it's okay, trust me. Trust me, you know, to enforce it or not. Just say the right thing. That's nonsense. Okay? It's like saying, you know what, we plan for 6.9 million, but we are not really going to do it. <laughs> right? 6.9 million people, but you know, it's only a working parameter. No. I think when you want to infringe on the citizen's constitutional right guaranteed under the law, I'm sorry, but you have to do better than that. Our next speaker is a social analyst. He writes this blog called The Heart Truth. H-E-A-R-T, not the other one, okay? The other one is written by somebody else. Roy, uh, Roy Mung is a social analyst and a blogger. He writes really, really well. And if you go to his blog, you will see all kinds of statistics and charts and stuff. But don't be frightened. He, he explains them very clearly. If you want to know about CPF, population, you know, education, whatever, go to his blog and you will see what the mainstream media don't tell you. Here's Roy Moon. Hello everyone, I am Roy, and I am the blogger of The Hard Truth. I am honoured and humbled to be here today to be a voice among Singaporeans to speak up against the MDA licensing rule. The MDA licensing rule has to go! For more, for more than 40 years, Singaporeans couldn't protest in Singapore. 
And in the past, if you speak up, what will happen to you? You will be arrested, you will be jailed, you will be thrown into prison, you will be sued and you will be made bankrupt. This year is the first time in Singapore's history since our independence that we are able to come here in the thousands to speak up and to voice out for what is right for us. Great job Singaporeans and we must continue to do this. Now, the government tells us it's okay. Trust them. Give them time. After a while, when the license takes effect, then we will know that we can trust them. So this is what the government says. This is what Jacob says. But Singaporeans, how many years have we given the government to make things right? 50 years! They want us to do, they want us to read the right thing. But are they doing the right thing? No! Over the past more than one decade, Singaporeans' median wages have remained stagnant. In fact, for the poorest in Singapore, since 2000, their real wages have actually dropped. Dropped! The percentage of people who are able to meet their CPF minimum sum and Medicaid minimum sum has also dropped. Yet, healthcare costs have increased and the percentage of the government spending on healthcare has dropped. Is it any wonder that many people, especially the elderly, do not dare to go to see a doctor? So, the government wants us to read the right thing. But are they doing the right thing? No! If they are not doing the right thing, then what do they want us to read? The wrong thing! Today, our retirement funds, and that is our CPF, is the smallest among all the developed countries. The smallest among all the developed countries. I'm a bit tall. <laughs> and not only that, our retirement funds are even lower than developing countries like Malaysia and Philippines. Developing countries. We are the richest country in the world by per capita GDP, but we have the lowest retirement funds in the developed countries. Disgraceful! Disgraceful, yes! Disgraceful! Yeah. Our CPS is invested in the GIC and the Tomasic Holdings. The GIC is ranked the 8th largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, and the Tomasic Holdings is ranked the 11th largest sovereign wealth fund in the world. But our CPF is the lowest in the developed countries. Now, we must not sit down and we must not wait for the government to change and to treat us better. We need to stand up and we need to ask the government to change. If not, we will change the people in the government. Yeah. The government, I repeat, the government cannot expect to tell the people to sit down and listen to the right thing. When there is no right thing, when there's nothing right about how there are more and more elderly who have to work in a hawker centre to be cleaners and be paid very low wages. My question to you is this, are you willing to work long hours every day and get paid only a few hundred dollars in Singapore? No. Are you willing? No. Of course, our government ministers won't understand this. Because why? Because they are paid millions of dollars, will they know how hard it is to be poor? The government tells us that the elderly want to stay active. They want a hobby. And so the government says we should encourage them to work. But do you know that in 2005, when the government conducted a survey, 62% of the elderly said that they needed to work because they need the money. This is up from 39% in 1995. That's 10 years, 20% increase in 1995. Now, after 8 years, is there another 20% increase? Are there 80% of the elderly who want to work because they do not have enough money? So the government tells us that the elderly wants to work. Many of our elderly are in the blue collar industry. Many of our elderly are lowly paid. Now, if the government wants us to read the right thing, will you know all this if we read their right thing? Because they're not right. Well, Singaporeans, 
are suffering and we cannot just read their writing because we won't know what is going on. If there was no one to speak up for the elderly, who will speak up for them? In this new room, the government wants to tell us to take down our articles within 24 hours. Think about it. If you're not happy with something someone has said, would you tell the person to shut up? Or would you want the person to talk to you to find out why? So why does the government doesn't want to talk to us? Why does the government want us to keep quiet? We have no answer! The government says online news sites need to be licensed. But which are these sites? Obviously the government already know which these sites are because they are monitoring them. So why not let everyone know which these sites are? Let us all know which these sites are. Let us all know how many unique visitors there are. Let us know if we agree with you. Yeah. Now if the government had bothered to speak to any one of us here, we would have told them who says that we want our articles to be taken down. If we don't want to read something, we won't read it. If there is something we don't agree with, we will talk about it. We are not like them. Who says that we want our articles to be taken down? The people don't need the government to prevent us from reading. We have our own eyes, we have our own minds. And we can decide what to read. So if this is the case, who is the government really wanting to protect? Now today, there are only 10 new sites, new websites that the government wants to license. Now that's today. But what will happen tomorrow? Or what will happen in GE 2015 or 2016? Will there suddenly be 100 sites? 200 sites? Who will know? Only the government will know. When there are too many sites which are licensed, will we still be able to read? Will we still be able to know what is going on in Singapore? Will we still have a stake in our own country? Maybe the question that the government should ask is not how do you censor the internet so that more people will read the newspapers? Maybe the real question that the government should ask is this Why are, cho why are people choosing to read the internet instead of your newspapers? <laughs> What is wrong with their newspapers? <laughs> the MDA says, Singaporeans, let us decide what is good for you. We will make the decision for you. And we will decide what to remove because it is for your own good. Now let me tell you how a truly democratic country works. In the Nordic countries, the newspapers have a press council. These press councils are independent of the government. All the newspapers sign on to this council because they want to show the public how they are responsible with what they publish. So if a member of public, and that's you, believes that a newspaper has written something which is not right, the individual can write to the council. The council meets every month to discuss, and if the newspaper has been found to have breached a code of conduct, they have to print a notice on their newspaper. So, you see, in a country where everyone has their rights, in a country that is truly democratic, and not just, it is not just some people, every person in the country, an individual like you and I, gets hurt. We all get to speak out, not just the MDA. Now, many countries have adopted press councils. But in Singapore, why does the government want to censor instead of let people consult with one another? In Singapore, the MPA expects Singaporeans to listen to them. The MPA believes they know everything. Should this be the way, Singaporeans? No! The MPA is not in a position to make such a decision. The people, we should have the right to do so. If the government doesn't trust the people, how can the people expect the people, how can the government expect the people to trust the government? 
Singapore, Singapore has been independent for almost 50 years. In 2015, we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of our country's independence. But what is there to celebrate? On 1st June 2013, the government imposed a licensing rule on online news sites. What does this mean for us? This means that we will not be able to read what they do not want us to read. We will not be able to know what they do not want us to know. We will not be able to think because will you really know what is happening in Singapore? Will we know the truth that is happening in Singapore? Now, if the government doesn't take this rule down, we will lose our independence. We will lose our independence to read, to know, to think and to be who we are. But there are some people who say, but the opposition is not strong enough. I won't talk about the opposition today. Mr. Tan Ji Fei has said in his speech at the Labour Day protest that there are many capable opposition politicians with sterling qualifications and I agree with him. But my question to you is this. Many of us have a good education. If we think that we cannot be responsible and help to run the country, I think we are in a very dangerous position. There are 3.5 million Singaporeans in Singapore. Do you think that we can only rely on 90 people in the government to make all the decisions for us? Are we saying that among the 3.5 million people in Singapore that we are not good enough to run this country? Now even if we don't have a degree, I know that there are some people with IT research or are from normal technical streams who are equally very smart. Some of them have set up their own businesses. The Population White Paper has also called our nurses low-skilled workers. But I have seen smart thinkers among our nurses as well. No one is not good enough to help to run this country. Everyone is good enough. And we need to believe in ourselves. Whoever is in government, we make sure that the government will listen to us. Now the government should be asking us, is this what you want? The government should not be telling us, this is what we want you to want. So whoever is put into government, we must make sure that we also help to provide solutions and run this country. We cannot just rely on the government. Okay, but isn't this what we are already doing online? Many of us are writing articles and many of us are commenting on blogs, forums, Facebook to provide solutions to run this country. Which is why it is so important that we need to protect the freedom of our internet. We need to protect our right to read, to find out more, to think, and to help make our lives even better. We need to free our internet. And this is why it is so important that we have to speak up and stand up against the licensing rule. The licensing rule has to go. Our right to know and think has to be protected. We must protect our own independence. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Uh, okay, Roy is a very passionate person, as you can see.